To talk more now about the selection of Tim Walls as the Democratic VP candidate, I wanted to bring in Stan Barnes. He's a political consultant. You see him quite often here on our air. So, Stan, what was your reaction right away when you heard that Tim Walls was selected and Josh Shapiro was not? Yeah, my reaction was, Tim who? And I think that's the reaction most Americans are going to have. He's, he's a really an unknown political figure nationally. And then when I figured out that he was the governor of Minnesota and, and some of his record and the like and where he sits on the political paradigm of, of issues and things, I was surprised by the choice because I feel like it doesn't bring to the Democratic ticket that which Kamala Harris lacks. And I thought she would try to, to essentially fill in the gaps in her policy resume, for instance, with the governor of Pennsylvania in that swing state, or with our own Mark Kelly, who at least would bring uh, the border issue to, uh, and gravitas to that topic uh, to the uh, Harris campaign. But nonetheless, uh, she's, the, she's the nominee, and, and she must have decided this is the right person. Yeah, and obviously, too, there is a sense of, I mean, you have to have some kind of chemistry. I mean, you have to like the person, right, that you're running with. Um, I mean, some might argue that John McCain, I don't know if he probably had that with Sarah Palin, right? I mean, we know how that ended up. Um, but, but you have to like the person, too, right, that you're going to be campaigning with. You do. In fact, I, I, I read a, a Washington article that, uh, essentially asserted that when everything was in the balance about the decision that Kamala Harris decided she just simply liked this governor, that they click in person, that they, they sing from the same sheet of music. And and so that, that in the end became uh, what tipped the balance in his direction. Um, we've heard some things that he's said, he has said already, and he specifically has talked about IVF and that his two children are here because of IVF. And that is gonna be an issue that will be on our ballot. I mean, reproductive rights, that will be an issue on our ballot here in the fall. Do you think that that might resonate with people here in our state, especially when he and Harris are in town on Friday? I think that they will certainly lead and close with that topic because it is the democratic uh, strong point when it comes to the, the list of and the litany of issues. Let's face it, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are in the White House now, and most people think the economy is in bad shape, and most people think the southern border is a wide open mess. And so the, uh, the Harris waltz ticket doesn't have a lot to talk about when it comes to the economy that people believe or the southern border, but they do have the abortion question and, and that pro-choice position, mm -hmm. which polls as a majority position. The, the problem, I think, in terms of just a detached strategic point of view, is I think that the the pro-life, pro-choice voter is already baked in, meaning that it's that voter has already decided long ago that the Democratic Party is the pro-choice party, the Republican Party is more the pro-life party, or at least let the states sort it out party. And so I, I don't think it brings the kind of uh, balance tipping that they want in Arizona. What they have to do in Arizona is talk about the border. Mm -hmm. And they can't talk about the border without sounding like they don't have an answer uh, for the democratic responsibility of the last few years. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I know that, I'm sure that they are gonna be bringing up the the deal that you know was not passed and, and that was killed. And, yes. and that will be, that's how they're gonna handle it, right? That is right. I mean, that's exactly right. They There was a, a, a bipartisan deal that would address some of the border issues. It's been painted as by Democratic consultants as the, the nirvana answer to solve all our problems at the border and that Donald Trump personally cratered it. Whether that's true or not, we'll let voters decide, but that's how they remedy their, their problem politics mm -hmm. on the Southern border issue. So we have 90 days or so, I mean, until you know November and uh, a lot as we know, can change in just a couple of days, a couple of weeks. What are you kind of expecting to see from both campaigns moving forward as, you know, these 90 days start to uh, start to uh, go by very quickly? Yeah, I don't think we're going to hear a lot from uh, Governor Walsh or J.D. Vance. I, and it, they will go back to 
vice presidential normalcy, which is you had your moment, you got to be the nominee, you get to ride on the ticket, but we don't really want to hear from you. We want to hear from the nominees, mm -hmm. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. So I think I think that is one thing that's going to happen. The other is uh, the uh, Trump campaign is certainly going to try to tell the American people what they think of Kamala Harris's record. And depending on where you sit in, in the political spectrum, there is a lot of negative things to talk about. I mean, after all, she is, without any judgment on my part, a San Francisco liberal. That's a fact, politically speaking. And, and the Trump campaign will want to make sure everyone knows that because as we know in Arizona, uh, San Francisco liberals don't do well politically in Arizona. So I, I, that's what I believe they're gonna do nationally. On the other side, it's going to be the Harris campaign reminding voters that uh, they don't like Donald Trump and that there might be a certain chaos factor with Donald Trump. And then Trump himself is probably gonna help out with that uh, yeah. because he's he's gonna continue to be Donald Trump and say things that that uh, upset a lot of people. And, and so the cars will crash into one another in November with those two big messages. They, the chaos candidate of Donald Trump or the, the liberal candidacy of Kamala Harris. I, you know, in Arizona, I think the, uh, the advantage is to Trump because we don't like California liberals, but Trump lost to Joe, Joe Biden, of course, four years ago. And so who knows what's gonna happen? Yeah, I know. It I think, I think as we talk about, it certainly is going to be close, especially in our state. And some had even said that even if Mark Kelly was maybe on the ticket that Arizona might might not go left, um, even if Mark Kelly was on the ticket. Now, it certainly could help elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's going to come down to the battleground states, right? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, that's in the end, that's probably one reason, one big reason Governor Walsh was chosen. Minnesota shouldn't be in play for Democrats, but it, but it is. And the, the Midwest, mm -hmm. that, that, that industrial Midwest may be where the jump ball is on all of this. And J.D. Vance is Ohio and Walsh is Minnesota. And that might, that might be part of the calculus here of, of trying to neutralize that Midwestern vote. But the, the swing states are still gonna be the swing states and, and the arguments will remain. If, if we knew the, this political, the answer to this political equation, what is worse, the Donald Trump's uh, unorthodox style and how that plays in the middle of the political spectrum or the, the state of the economy and the state of the southern border and how that plays in the political spectrum. If we knew the answer there, you could name who's going to be the next president because I think that's where the equation is going to be written. Yeah. All right. Well, I know we're going to be talking to you often in the next couple of days. Uh, Stan Barnes, thanks so much for, for your insight. We always appreciate it. You bet, Ellen. Thank you.